Uh, so tonight I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, global index investing uh, more broadly, uh, and then I suppose uh, bring it back to the two products that we bring into the JSC uh, very soon. Um, but to start off with, just to give you some an introduction to who CoreShares is for those that that don't know. Uh, so we currently manage uh, eight uh, exchange-traded funds on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, um, five uh, vanilla, well, not vanilla, five equity products, uh, one of which is vanilla, and then the other four uh, track various strategic indices, what we call smart beta indices. These are indexes that invest in uh, particular strategies like dividends and low volatility and so forth. Um, we also uh, have two property ETFs known as prop tracks, and then we have a preference share uh, ETF that trades in the market as well. Uh, and I've personally been involved in the ETF market now since, uh, since 2012. Uh, my banking career started in, uh, in 2003. And I must say that the last few years, whilst I've been working in this environment specifically, uh, it's been pretty easy to get up in the mornings because I think from a commercial point of view, uh, we're quite excited about the growth of the, the index tracking market and the ETF market uh, and, and the developments globally within this type of product. So there's a lot of sort of market out there for us to hopefully cap capture uh, on the one hand. But also I believe that index funds um, are great savings products for, for, the average, for the average person. They call uh, ETFs the democratization of the fund management industry. And what they mean by that is that today, the average Joe, the average investor, can get access to whole markets, tens of shares, and in some cases, hundreds of shares, by buying one simple unit or buying into one fund that is run at a, at a, at a low cost. And you get wonderful, wonderful exposure. Compared to, you know, when my grandfather used to dabble on, on the stock exchange, it was a totally different environment. It was high cost, very difficult to get lots of exposure, and so forth. So... ETFs have been booming globally, um, and core shares, uh, you know, one of our key kind of business areas is to build a meaningful ETF business uh, here in South Africa. So we currently have the eight products, and then as I say, we're going to be t talking about the two uh, other new products that, we, that we're bringing to market. A bit of our history there, I, I can take questions on this um, uh, later on. But it's been a bit of a sort of a slow and steady uh, product rollout, I suppose. We've also taken over some ETFs from other providers. So those of you uh, perhaps who invested in the um, Nedbank Beta, Beta Beta ETF, we now uh, manage that ETF at CoreShares. We took it over from Nedbank uh, earlier this year, and I know it's, it's one of Simon's uh, favorites. Okay, so on to the two ETFs that, that we're bringing to market. Um, Right now um, on the JSC, there are five other ETFs which Deutsche runs uh, that give you access to international markets. So you, you buy the ETF in South Africa, in RANDs, uh, but the assets that the ETF is referencing are global. So Deutsche currently runs the US, uh, UK, European, Japan, and an all-world tracker fund. So these are ET ETFs that give you simple exposure to those markets. But the beauty of it is that you just uh, trade that ETF here on the JSC in, in RANDs. Uh, and we, um, we were jealous of those products. We wanted to bring some ourselves. So we've now done that. We've now, we're now launching two of our own uh, in the marketplace. And um, we've, we've gone with different indices to the ones that, uh, that, they, that they're running. So the, the first is a global property ETF. Now... Listed property in South Africa has been an absolute, absolutely wonderful asset class. I mean, if you speak to anyone who's been investing in listed property companies that trade on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, so these are companies that own properties but whose shares trade on various stock markets around the world. In, in South Africa, the JSC, our listed property index, has done incredibly well. It's been one of the, the standout asset classes uh, in South Africa over, say, the last uh, 20 years, and it's been, it's been a really good place to have been invested. Um, the South African market, the South African property market, the list of property companies in South Africa have got about 350 billion market cap. That's all of them combined. So these are some companies you may know, Growth Point, Redefine, Nepi, um, Fortress, etc. 
those are some of the names in our local market. Um, uh, they've got a combined market cap of 350 billion. In the main, they give you exposure to uh, the local property scene. Uh, so, so um, you know, a lot of our big malls in South Africa will be owned by those property uh, property counters. Um, but what if you could have an ETF that trades on our exchange that actually gives you exposure to worldwide global property? Uh, and that's what we are doing with this particular ETF. So it's known as the Core Shares S&P Global Property ETF, and it tracks an index called uh, the S&P Global Property 40 Index. Uh, so as you may know, uh, S&P Dow Jones Indices is a, is a worldwide uh, index provider. They run indexes in different markets, uh, capturing different investment themes and so forth. So they have a whole series of property indices. Uh, and the one that we've decided to focus on is the S&P Global Property 40 Index. And it's very simply the 40 largest listed property companies in the world trading in developed markets. So uh, the index invests across eight different markets, and these are some of the world's, well, they are the world's uh, very biggest uh, list of property companies. The combined market cap of this index is over 10 trillion rand across 40 companies. So these are very big companies. They're very liquid. You can buy their shares very easily, but they trade in all these different markets around the world, eight different, uh, eight different markets. So what this index does is it simply captures all 40 of those particular stocks. So we're positioning this um, ETF for, for someone who wants to include global property, perhaps next to his local property exposure or her local property exposure, as a, as a classic, classic building block uh, in one's portfolio. It's a great diversification tool and it complements many investment strategies. Uh, and we think that this global index is really just a, 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 a catch-all, it captures such a broad part of that particular market. Um, so it's got a it's got a yield of three point two percent. Remember, property companies are generally uh, pay a good yield. Okay, this is slightly lower than local property because it's global, but property generally sp speaking pays a good yield because obviously the companies are collecting all the rentals from the underlying properties that it owns. So it's generally bought for yield purposes, listed property. This index has got a yield of uh, three point two percent, and that's historic. And because the ETF will be trading in our market in RANDs, yet the assets are in these eight developed markets that I was talking about. You get good um, RAND hedge exposure. So, um, well, well, you get absolute RAND hedge exposure because your, your RAND ETF that you're buying here will be referencing all these, uh, all these global economies. Um, so, it's a very good way to diversify, uh, to, to diversify globally. So this is how the index is constructed. As I said, it's the 40 largest listed property companies in the world. It's a market cap weighted index, which means that the index just simply, uh, we, we weight between the 40 stocks simply based on size. So the biggest um, company in this index is a US com a property company called Simon Property Group. It's just over 9% of the index. Simon Property Group has got a market cap uh, in the US of over $60 billion, very large company. It would have the largest weighting in this particular index. And then the second, the second biggest will have the slightly lower weighting and so on and so forth. So it's a market cap weighted product, very simple construct. Um, it's got a few basic rules around it. For instance, it caps the largest stock at 10%. So Simon Property Group's currently at 9%, but if Simon Property Group were to move up to 11% in the index, the index would actually cap it at 10% and then reallocate that 1% to some of the other shares, which means that you don't get any one or two securities or two shares getting a major exposure relative to, to the other. So yeah, it's, it's a fairly straightforward index to understand. It's, it's just that. It's, it's the 40 largest um, uh, list of property companies in the world, companies whose primary focus is investing, managing, uh, and growing property portfolios and generating returns from property ownership. And this property ownership um, can... Um, differ between retail, uh, hospitality, industrial, logistics, uh, residential, and so on. Okay, this map hasn't come out very well, but at least you can see the, the tags and the booklets that I've handed out, you'll see, see the, the, the breakdown as well. Uh, the index is primarily based out of the US, so over 55% of, of the index is US exposure. 
uh, and then a lot of uh, eastern exposure, which is quite nice. So Japan, Hong Kong, uh, and Australia. Interestingly, the index has got a relatively small holding to, to Europe, UK, um, and other European uh, um, countries. Uh, and at the moment, we quite like that. And the reason I say that is that on our local exchange in the JSC, there are already quite a number of UK and European property companies that have raised money on our local market. So you can already get access to that part of the global property market you know, on, on our exchange currently. So in terms of diversifying away from some of the companies that you may know, like Capco and Intu and Nepi and so forth, uh, this gives you very good diversification away from the, those those European um, holdings. Yes, yeah, so so we would the index will track all the different currencies that underpin those flags. Correct, correct. Yeah, so multiple currencies. So we once we raise a hundred rand on the JSC, we externalize that money to our custodian in Paris, Sockgen. And then from there, we buy all the different currencies so that we can then buy the shares that trade in those markets that buy and hold property. So you can see it's truly globally diversified. Uh, and those 40 stocks, say half of them are in the US and then the other half are, are scattered about the rest of the world map. As I was saying just now, uh, uh, global property companies, you get a lot of variation in, type, in terms of the types of property companies out there. So, so across healthcare, residential, logistics, storage, industrial, retail, uh, so on and so forth. So remember, in investing, generally speaking, diversification is your friend. So here you've got diversification across currencies, you've got diversification across sectors uh, within, within, the property, within the property space, which is generally a good thing. Um, and then there are the top 10 holdings. If you're interested, you can Google uh, any of these companies and have a look at the actual physical bricks and mortar properties that these companies uh, would own. We aren't actively selecting these. Remember, these, this is a passive fund. It's an index fund. We just simply buy the shares that qualify for the index, the 40 largest, and those are the top 10 uh, of the 40 largest. And you can see the bulk of them are based in, in the US. We've also done a comparison to see how this index has performed relative to active managers in South Africa who have a global property mandate. So I'm going back to the classic sort of active versus passive analysis to see how are stock pickers who are given a, a job to do to go out and build a portfolio, how are they doing relative to, to the index? Uh, and we do this all the time in our business. It's one of our favorite things to do. But generally speaking, the same trend pops up all the time. And that it's very difficult to beat some of these broad benchmarks over time. You can do it over shorter time periods. But over the long term, beating low-cost indexes is very, very difficult. And the same plays out uh, in the global property market if you're trying to do stock picking uh, from South Africa. And, of course, the ETF is also a lot cheaper than, than most actively managed unit trusts that would go out and try and capture this investment opp opportunity. The other ETF that we bring to market that we're naturally very excited about is the country's first S&P 500 uh, ETF. Uh, now, now, I was mentioning the Deutsche products earlier. Uh, the Deutsche guys have got a, a US ETF uh, that captures a very similar um, uh, portfolio of, of stocks. That's an MSCI US index, whereas this is the S&P 500, slightly different indices, uh, but give you very much the same exposure. But uh, we like the S&P 500 specifically. The S&P 500 really represents the very origins of index investing. And in some ways, I'm sorry, I didn't start with this index and then move on to the property uh, index, because the property index, by comparison to this one, is perhaps a little bit more complicated. But the S&P 500 is the first index that was ever put into a product format, uh, all the way back into uh, in the 1970s when, when Jack Bogle or John Bogle uh, started, uh, started Vanguard. So through his observations in the U.S. And, and various other thought leaders at the time in the U.S., he identified that it was very, very difficult for active managers, stock pickers in the United States to beat the S&P 500, which is the main benchmark in the U.S. in terms of how 
their market is doing. The main market barometer in the US is the S&P 500. So uh, the first index funds put together were the S&P 500 funds all the way back to the 1970s. So whenever you read a book or an article or just about anything to do with indexing, uh, it generally references, uh, generally references the S&P 500. And what's so great about it is that, um, okay, Kelly is made up of 500 securities. Okay, so you knew that. Uh, but it's, it's, it's 500. It's a lot of securities. So it's very broadly diversified over, over hundreds of securities. The biggest holding that the S&P 500 has is Apple, and that's over, just over, over 3%. So you get wonderful diversification over a whole number of sectors and a whole lot of uh, companies that are listed and traded um, on, on the New York Stock Exchange. Okay, this gives you a sense of how big the S&P 500 is. This bar chart compares the S&P 500 to our local JSC, so you get a sense of the scale of that market relative to our own market. Um, America is still today by far sort of the wealthiest country with the deepest capital markets, which means that whenever you have a global corporate that wants to raise capital, uh, the most meaningful place for it to go and raise that capital is at the New York Stock Exchange, because that's where the big, the big global investors are. It's, got to, it's what we call the capital market. It's got the deepest capital, capital market. So it's a very, very big index. Uh, and you can see it absolutely dwarfs our local, our local, um, local JSC. Uh, and as I say, since the 1970s, when S&P 500 funds were still put together, um, were first put together, there's now literally trillions that are benchmarked against the S&P 500 and trillions that are even invested in the S&P 500. So it's a major, major benchmark uh, within the investment, um, uh, within the investment world. <clears throat> Again, um, what we're doing in the marketplace, okay, I've spoken about the S&P 500 ETF in the US and the funds put together in the 1970s. So globally, uh, there's some 70 ETFs around the world that track this S&P 500 just because it is so popular and it's such a widely used investment uh, tool or investment uh, technique. This is the first time it's trading in our market in RAND, so you can simply buy it here on the JSC. Ordinarily, you would have to apply to move monies overseas to the US, UK, and buy the products uh, in those particular uh, markets. So suffice to say, uh, it's a very liquid index, um, and it's a fairly easy uh, index to understand. 500 largest companies in the US, Bit different, I might add, to the Fortune 500. You know, you always hear in movies, uh, this guy is so he's a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. S&P 500 is not the Fortune 500. Fortune 500 differs because some of the companies inside the Fortune 500 aren't listed companies. These are the 500 top listed companies. So there'll be a few guys who have own a Fortune 500 company that's not in the S&P 500. It just so happens that they carry the same number of shares. But as I was saying earlier, uh, the U.S. Is, uh, has the deepest capital markets. It has the biggest investors trading on that, on that particular exchange. So it's no wonder that the global giants, the global corporations, the giants of, of today's industry, when they choose the stock market in terms of where they want to list and where they want to raise capital, choose the S&P 500. So within the top 10 uh, holdings of the S&P 500, you'll find your everyday brands that you're using. So if I asked you who here has touched one of these brands, every one of you has touched the, a brand in the top 10 holdings today. So who today has engaged with Microsoft in some other format? Hey? Who today has engaged with Apple in some other format? Johnson & Johnson, Facebook, um, and so it goes on. Need I say Google, Alphabet as well. So these are household brands. They are the leading corporations in the world. Uh, and when they've raised capital, they've gone to the US and they've raised capital and that's where their primary listing is and that's where their shares are, are priced. So those are some of the top, um, sorry, I've gone forward a slide, I'll come back to this one. So those are the top 10 holdings in the uh, S&P 500. Uh, Apple, Microsoft, Exxon Mobile, Amazon, Johnson Johnson, Facebook, Berkshire Hathaway, General Electric, AT&T, and JB Morgan, Morgan Chase. Let me come back to the slide, though. I just want to go back to this world map. 
The other interesting thing about uh, the S&P 500 is even though it is premised on the New York Stock Exchange and these corporations that trade in the New York Stock Exchange, as I've just demonstrated, all of you are customers in the main of those 10 or, or some of those 10, 10 brands, which goes to show that the, a lot of those 10 companies or all the companies of the S&P 500 are not necessarily US companies, they are global corporations. So today, uh, over 44% of revenues on the S&P 500 are generated outside of the US. Apple's sales right here in South Africa would be counted as part of that. Microsoft sales here in South Africa would be uh, counted as part of that. So it is actually globally representative of uh, a lot of uh, corporate success stories, not necessarily just the US. So regardless of your, of whatever you might think of the US election coming up, whether you think it's, uh, whether you think Trump's got a chance and whether you think uh, the sky is falling or not, uh, shouldn't really affect the S&P 500 too much because it is more uh, a tale of of the world's again global leaders than it is of the U.S. economy specifically. But of course, if the U.S. economy is doing really well, then that's also a good thing. But I'm just saying that the companies here aren't necessarily completely reliant on the U.S. economy. So you can invest in the S&P 500 as almost as, uh, as a separate decision in terms of what you believe you know, the prospects of the U.S. economy are specifically. They're not completely divorced, but I think you can divorce them to, to a degree. So the revenues of the S&P 500 come from a number of other countries and, and areas outside of the U.S. Uh, a few of the companies don't classify exactly where their revenues are. That's why there's this funny number up, outright. So some, some give exact breakdowns. Others are just a bit, a bit vague. So they say U.S., non-U.S. Type, type thing. All right, they're the top 10 constituents I was talking about, uh, and then they're the sector weighting. So now the, the nice thing about the S&P 500 as well, uh, as a South African JSC investor, is that you get access to sectors or industries that you can't readily access on our local exchange. So what I mean by that is on our local exchange, we've got four or five very good cash retailers that you can buy their shares, and that's quite a lot a fairly good retail proxy in your portfolio, right? We don't have four or five technology stocks that are really worth putting in your portfolio. We've got one massive one that makes up sort of 20% of our market nearly, being NASPERS and its investment in Tencent. But outside of that, there's not a lot of technology companies that trade on, on our exchange. The S&P 500 has over 20% of its market cap invested in technology stocks. The ones that I was just talking about, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, etc. Those are all stocks that would form part of the technology component of the S&P 500. The second biggest sector of the S&P 500 is another sector that we don't have a huge amount of exposure to on the JSC, and that's healthcare. So on the JSC, if you're looking to invest in the healthcare sector, you have a couple of choices. You can buy Adcock and uh, Aspen and some of the hospital groups that have their shares trading, but they're nowhere nearly as big and diverse as some of the big um, uh, healthcare companies that trade in America and that are raising capital on the New York Stock Exchange and then come into the S&P 500. And so if you are of the point of view that healthcare is a major area to be investing in in the future as uh, medical science continues to evolve and we all live longer, et cetera, et cetera, then to have uh, an index that has a big exposure to healthcare is also, is also nice. So interesting sector allocations relative to, to the local, to the local uh, market. Once again, uh, we've looked at how local fund managers here who run RAND-based unit trusts who say to clients, I'll, give me your money, I'll stock pick global securities for you. Generally speaking, they don't do particularly well against this big index. Even in America, they don't do well. Sitting here in South Africa and entrusting someone to stock pick global securities is a very difficult task uh, indeed. And th these, these slides and figures uh, show that. Okay, so to sort of summarize where we are here, um, we looked at two indexes, the S&P 500, which is really iconic. As I say, it, it represents the very early index funds that were first put together by, uh, by Vanguard. And as I say, there are now 
tens of ETFs that track that particular strategy. What we're excited about is to bring that, that ETF right here to the JSC so you can buy it in RANDs. You don't have to have your money in a stockbroking account uh, in the UK. So we've got that index coming to our market. And then secondly, for those who want to invest in property outside of South Africa, they can just invest in a simple index of global property that gives you exposure to eight different uh, markets and some of the world's uh, leading property companies. Um, I don't know about any of you, but I found myself on about three spam email lists where I get invited to invest in some investment flat going up somewhere in the north in England, and it's the I must get in now type thing. Anyone else get those emails? Okay, so let's compare the, 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 the opportunity, shall we, for a moment. Uh, investment flat sitting somewhere in northern England, needing constant plumbing attention, lick of paint every fourth or fifth year, can't sell it. Uh, or if you do want to sell it, it's going to take three to six months to sell it. Hack to go over there. You know, you've got to go and see it. You've got to chat to the state agent. You've got to work out how you're going to get your money there. You've got to go through the paperwork there. Oh, my goodness me. Sounds like a lot of work, right? Uh, to, to externalize your money and invest in a silly investment property in northern England that just sounds way too expensive. Whereas here, you could just simply buy one security, uh, one share, that then gives you exposure to a whole basket of some of these, the, these uh, uh, global, global giants. And um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to sound insincere for a moment now, but we actually did get an email from a client the other day who just said he's been wanting to invest in overseas property. He's a teacher. He doesn't have big sums of money to externalize. And this gives him simple, real bricks and mortar exposure in hard currency and you know, he's just really chuffed at the opportunity and, you know, that obviously put us in a good mood around the office and I'll make that email public if I need to, but, but it, it, that pretty much sums up the opportunity there uh, across sort of uh, eight, eight, different, uh, eight different markets. Okay, so a bit more detail on the securities themselves. Um, so how we've structured this at CoreShares is that we actually uh, launched the ETFs, uh, they're already in existence, they're not trading on the JSC yet, but they're already in existence. Uh, we, cre we created them and launched them in Mauritius earlier this year, so they've been trading on the Mauritius Stock Exchange uh, since May. And now what we've done is we've applied to all of our local regulators to make those ETFs available on our stock exchange. So they'll trade on our stock exchange, but their primary listing will be on the Mauritius uh, Stock Exchange. And that's how, uh, in terms of our current exchange control rules, the Reserve Bank allows what they call an inward listing, a share that lists in our market, and they allow for the currency to, to leave our market. So you buy the share here in RANDs, you sell it here in RANDs, and you don't have to worry about moving money abroad or anything else. So from a structure perspective, that's what we did. So the shares are really trading. When it comes to the JSC, it will trade in RANDs. It's got a, a share price of 36 Rand 20. That was at the end of uh, September. Tracks the Global Property 40 Index, pays semi-annual distributions, uh, quarterly rebalancing, uh, and it's been FSB approved by our local, uh, local regulators. In fact, this, these funds have been approved by everybody. I, I had to go through five regulators to bring them to market. So they're regulated in Mauritius, the CIS funds. They're regulated by the Mauritius Stock Exchange. They're going to be regulated by our JFC. They're regulated by our Financial Services Board. And the South African Reserve Bank had to approve the externalization of, of monies. So when you hear uh, people from the industry say, beware of products that aren't properly regulated, this is not one of them because we've gone through a lot of trouble to, to bring this to, 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 the local, to the local market. Okay, so this is the property one, uh, 36 Rand 20 per share, FSB approved. Likewise, with the S&P 500, um, that was the, that was the uh, September month in price. That price is deliberate, by the way. Uh, I don't know where the S&P index is trading at right now, but you'll see that that's sort of a, a fraction of the actual underlying index. So it gives you a, a bit of a gauge. Uh, the share price gives you a bit of a gauge as to where the actual, actual index is trading. Um, yeah, uh, so trades and rands, semi-annual distributions on both of them, yeah. 
All right, and then th these these ETFs are about to list. Um, we I, I've spent the last sort of two three weeks running around the marketplace, chatting to stockbrokers and investors about this particular opportunity. Uh, and so Monday and Tuesday next week, we're doing what's called a book build. A book build is just a process wherein investors can apply via their stockbroker before a share lists to say, hey, when this share lists, I want to be one of the first investors. So uh, uh, we're running the book build next week, Monday and Tuesday. Uh, and then those shares will list uh, the following week, Friday, which is Friday uh, the 4th. Um, uh, and then obviously the share will trade from then on in and we'll build the, build the two ETFs uh, over time. The, in terms of fees and costs, because I, I haven't spoken about that yet, um, the S&P 500 ETF uh, is going to have a management fee of 45 basis points. Um, I've already had some people say, well, how come that's not as cheap as the, the State Street Spider ETF, which has got a gazillion dollars under management in New York? Uh, it's quite a bit cheaper than 45 basis points, but the point is, is that to buy that product, you have to move your money to New York. So the same way as McDonald's costs something different in New York as it does here, well, so do financial products because you go, you know, you're moving money around and you're opening accounts and there's quite a lot of structuring involved in terms of bringing that product to, to South Africa. So anyway, the S&P 500 will cost 0.45% uh, and the property fund will cost 0.5%. Uh, uh, Those are the management fees. And the total expense ratios we expect to have between 0.55 and 0.65 uh, on both ETFs. So, uh, you know, we think that that's competitively priced for the exposure that we, that we, we give the market. Um, and, yeah, um, those are the share codes. So you can look them up once they list. So GLPROP on the property side and CSP500 for, for the S&P 500. Okay, and there, there the role players involved, the various regulators and ourselves. 